morning, church. Uh, I'm going to be uh, reading from Ephesians 18 to 21. Uh, Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless, reckless living. But be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord or Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Quick poll. What is the most repeated command in the Bible? Just think about that. It's not any of the prohibitions or warnings. The most repeated command in the Bible is not about sex, money, or power. The most repeated command in the Bible will probably surprise you. Listen to it. Two words. Be happy. Be happy. God tells us, more than anything else in the Bible, in different ways to be happy. The ways in which He says it is, praise the Lord. That's a command. Do not be afraid. That's a command. Rejoice. That's a command. Give thanks, that's a command. And all of these commands, in essence, are to be happy. I just want to pause there. Just think about that. God wants you and I to be truly and deeply happy. Not just in heaven someday. Not only when circumstances take a turn for the better. Not only when sorrow or darkness finally lifts. No, God wants you to taste real joy today. Now, question. How happy are you? In terms of Christian practices or Christian disciplines, right? The things that Christians do. What do you think are the two top commands in the Bible, right? So not the most repeated one, but in terms of what Christians are supposed to do, what do you think are the top two commands in the Bible? First one, pray. Second one, sing. Sing, sing, fam, sing. Pray and sing. Those are the two most commanded uh, practices in the Bible. How's your prayer life going? How's your singing going? I mean, the way that we landed Matlasona this morning, I would say the singing went quite well. The things I'm talking about now, fam, isn't a surprise, right? They're basic. And that's why we talk about them in this series. This series is called Basic Discipleship. And what we're trying to cover in this series is what do disciples do? And how do disciples act? And also, how would they know if they are growing as disciples themselves? We have a discipleship journey in Fellowship City. It's a way in which we describe how disciples are being made. It looks like this. Let me show it to you again. And I'm pretty sure that if you've been around for the last few weeks, you'll know where I'm going. If you haven't been around and this is the first time you're seeing it, just look how simple it is. We say a disciple loves God and loves people. That's at the center. And then we say how a disciple loves God and loves people is a disciple knows God, top corner. A disciple commits faithfully, bottom left. And a disciple gives generously, bottom right. And just to make sure that we have a handle on it, that we know how we do those things, we've got three dashes under each list. So a disciple knows God through His Word, through encountering Him, and through worship. A disciple commits faithfully to transformation, to God's people, and to the mission of the church. And a disciple gives generously of time, talents, and treasures. That is how we make disciples. That is also how you know that you are being formed as a disciple and that you're being transformed as a disciple. So today, we will be spending time up top. A disciple knows God through worship. Okay? That's the theme for today. Now, worship is more than just singing. But 
singing is a big part of worship. You guys see what I did there? So we are going to talk about singing and music today. One simple question, three simple answers, but supposed to be very, very profound. What makes music and singing so important? That's our map for today. The power of music, the grace of music, and the future of music. Are you with me? Let me pray. Father God, thank you for the privilege of being here now in these moments. Thank you for hearing your heart, and that is that you want us to be joyful, that you want us to be thankful, that you want us to be happy, and that you want us to experience all of these things now in the midst of everything that we arrived at church with this morning. Thank you that we could sing with our brothers and sisters. Thank you that that could be a reminder of who you are, who we are, and also what you've done for us. Father God, as we open up your word now, I pray that you would speak to us. We know that these words are old words, but they are lies. And they have a way to speak to us that changes us. And I pray that you would do that now as we open up the word. Anoint my lips. Please have me only say the things that you would want me to say. Open up our hearts. Keep us humble and teachable. We want to end with praise to your name, Lord Jesus. Have your way in us. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, let's look at the first one. What makes music and singing so important? The power of... Of music. Okay, so I've got a slide with some highlights. The highlights is to help us to get a grip on this portion of scripture. Okay, so watch it now. There's a don't and a but, and then there are five participles. In verbs. Look at it. Don't get drunk with wine. Got it. But be filled by the Spirit. Okay, shop. How do I know if I'm filled by the Spirit? Five ing's speaking singing making music giving thanks and submitting do you guys see it three of the five words that paul uses to describe to uh, to, to describe what it's like to be filled with the spirit has to do with music fascinating isn't it okay now, why on earth would Paul talk about drunkenness and then talk about being filled with the Spirit? Let's just pause there. I think that's important. Fam, when you get drunk, alcohol takes control of you. You are controlled by something, well, it used to be outside of you, but now it's inside of you. And that thing changes you, right? That's what happens when you get drunk. So you lose your inhibition. You lose the normal moral boundaries you have. Some people get really courageous and they do really stupid things. All the topics that you talk about change. Your ability to reason changes as well. Something has a grip on you and it changes your behavior. Okay? Paul says, don't do that with alcohol. That's a bad idea. And obviously, people drank a lot in Paul's day. People still drink a lot today. I think this is a really good warning for all of us. Paul says, do not let alcohol control you and change your behavior. Rather, 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 let the Spirit take control of you and change your behavior. Do you see why he uses that metaphor? Because knowing how alcohol enters the throat and the stomach and then the body and changes someone, Paul goes, that's actually a really good metaphor for how the spirit is supposed to come into someone, dwell in them, and then change their behavior. Now, if you get drunk, in the beginning, you feel absolutely phenomenal, right? It feels like you are on a high. But alcohol is actually a depressant. So very soon, that high becomes a really, really deep low, and then you become depressed, and you become numb. That's what it does to you when you give yourself over to alcohol. Right. It's not the same with the Spirit, fam. If you give yourself over to the Spirit, it does not make you depressed. Praise God for that. And it also doesn't numb you. It actually does exactly the opposite, right? And that is, it gives you life. The Holy Spirit is like a stimulus. And when you receive the Holy Spirit and when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you feel revitalized. 
you feel truly alive. I remember the very first Sunday when I experienced that. I walked out of the church building after the worship service in which the pastor explained that I am now justified and forgiven and I don't have to pay any of my sins. And as I walked out, the wind was blowing. Now at that time, I had long blonde hair with a blow-waved fringe. I wanted to look like a surfer. It's a joke now, isn't it? Afrikaans guy growing up in Pretoria wanting to look like a surfer from Derbs, eh? I wanted to. So usually if the wind would blow, I would go, oh no, oh no, the bouffon, my hair. That day, that day, I felt the wind for the first time like I've never felt it before. And I felt the sun shine on my forehead like I've never felt before. It was like I was alive. That is what the Spirit does to us. Now Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. It's a continuous command. Do you guys see it? Now that doesn't mean that you get the Spirit 100% and then the Spirit leaks and then you have to go utlache, full tank, please. It's not how it works, okay? You can't run out of the Spirit. That's not what this command means. It's not like you pull into a worship service and then you go, I'm on a quarter tank this morning. I'm hoping to go home full. It's not how it works. But what Paul says is you continuously have to give yourself over to the Spirit. Do you guys see it? If you want to remain drunk, you have to keep on drinking. If you want to remain filled with the Spirit, you have to keep on submitting yourself to the work of the Spirit and handing over control and handing over control and handing over control. That's how it works. You guys might remember, but in our deeper series, I preached about the Holy Spirit and I said the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is like a flatmate moving into your house. Your flatmate can be in your house, but you can choose not to speak to them. It doesn't mean that your flatmate has moved out. It just means that the relationship is cold. So the way in which you engage your flatmate is you walk to your flatmate and go, good morning. The way that you be filled with the Spirit in this way that Paul is talking about is by engaging the Spirit continuously, submitting to His control and saying, take control of me, make me alive again, change my behavior, guide me, teach me, give me power, give me comfort, give me wisdom, give me insight, create your fruit inside of me. Do you guys see it? Okay. Now, think of question of the day. Music does something to us. And that is why when Paul explains how you are filled with the Spirit or what happens to you when you are filled with the Spirit, he uses these three ings that all have to do with music. Okay, so check this. Do you speak, sing, and make music to be filled with the Spirit? Or are you filled with the Spirit... And then you speak, sing, and make music. Yes. That's the answer. It's both. Trigger warning. I'm going to use an intimate scene. Imagine I walk over to Marie, and I start kissing her. What a joyous experience. Am I kissing her, or is she kissing me? Or are we kissing each other? Do you guys see it? It's not an either or. It's both and. So when we speak, sing, and make music, we get filled with the Spirit. And when we get filled with the Spirit, what happens naturally? We speak, we sing, and we make music. Do you guys see it? Okay. Now, when God commands us to praise Him, right? Praise the Lord. Repeated command. What? does he want from us? Check Isaiah 29 verse 13. This is the Lord speaking to the prophet. And here's what he says. The Lord said, These people approach me with their speeches to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me. And human rules direct their worship of me. Okay, stop. Your lips can be here, but your heart and your head can be nowhere near this place. 
You guys know what I'm talking about? Do you know that feeling? Like you hear and you sing, but this bad boy is not here. And neither is your mind. Now, let's be honest. There are many reasons why we are distracted, sure. There are many reasons why we come to a worship service preoccupied, sure. Here's the problem, fam. God doesn't want that. Do you see it? He goes, if it's only lips and no heart and no head, I don't want it. So you can make as many excuses as you want. It's not going to please God. Our posture, like our attitude when we enter worship matters, fam. That's why we pray before we start our service. And the worship leader mostly says, let's posture our hearts for worship. Let's ask God to help us to be here, lips, heart, and head. It begs the question, how do you show up for a service? Like, with what do you pitch here? And what do you expect when you are in service and singing? God is commanding us to look at Him through what He's revealed to us about Himself, right? This is who I am. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And God wants us to look at Him until we see past all of the small things that's vying for our attention, right? God wants us to look at Him until we see something that rises above all of our everyday troubles and stuff and then proclaim that and sing that so that we can have an awful joy when we see that and experience that and then not have any other choice than to say words of praise. Think about it, fam. If you're struck with something beautiful, let's talk about music, it stops you in your tracks. And you immediately go, wow. It transcended everything that you were thinking about. Like you were on your way to do the dishes. You hear the song, it stops you right there. And all of a sudden, that's more important than the dishes. Still go and do the dishes, right? That's the right thing to do. But you know what I mean? That's what God wants of us. Is I know that we are all bogged down in the detail of everyday life, but God wants us to look, 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 until His glory rises above all of those things, and then we go, wow, 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 just look at Him. God is fighting for us. Who can be against us? We'll shout it out. That's more important to me now than anything else. Lips, heart, head, I'm all in. That's what God wants from us. Fam, really important line in this teaching text. Do you see that he says, make music with your heart to the Lord? According to the Bible, what do we bring to God? Anything? Whatever we feel like? Absolutely not. You bring valuable things to God. A little mud cake is not an appropriate sacrifice for the creator and the sustainer of everything. Do you know what I mean? Something that costs you is an appropriate sacrifice. According to the Bible, you don't pitch up at the altar and go, oh, let me see what's in my pocket here. Lip eyes? Do you like that? 2005 Ranex key? Yeah? Will that work? No, it won't. What you bring to worship has got value. And our words are meant and delivered with heart, soul, mind, and strength through music. Do you see it? We bring our valuable words to God in worship. It glorifies Him. It gives Him pleasure. And not only does it do that, do you know what also happens when we gaze at God and when we worship Him with our words? Do you guys know what happens? Someone else sees it. And then it helps those people to see and feel the same. Think about it. I'm in worship, right? Matla sona. It's going like a machine. I'm feeling it. I'm seeing it. I am all in. The guy next to me goes, he's clearly seeing or feeling something that I am not seeing or feeling, but I want to. It awakens people to the reality that there's something else to be seen. 
And that is the transcendent God in all His glory. Do you guys see that? That's what music does. The reverse is actually also true. Unfortunately. And that is, if you cruise like this, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Person next to you. Oh, that doesn't look like her. Think about it. Think about it, fam. Think about going to a sports game. The crowd is on it. Songs being sung. Mexican waves. Let's go, Jay-Z. Let's go, boy. Let's go, boy. What happens? You get up and you do exactly the same. What happens when the stadium dies down? Have you guys seen that at a sports game? Right? You're losing or something isn't going your way. People take their seats and all of a sudden, oh, the whole stadium is quiet. You're not going to be that guy that's going to go, Go, boys! Go, boys! Groot stoot nou! Bokke twee, drie! Bokke twee, drie! You're not going to do it because no one, no one else is doing it. You know what I mean? It's the same in terms of worship, fam. And musical is a, a music is a powerful part of worship because it can move us in deep and inspiring ways. Because when we sing, we sing songs about God's love. We sing songs about His peace, His joy. And we are reminded of His presence in our lives and the significance of our existence. Can we commit to doing this? And then growing in it together. Fam, this might be your next step. You might feel today that the Spirit is telling you, pitch on time for worship and pitch for worship. Like just posture yourself. Come with the expectation. Allow the words to speak to you as you sing them. Gaze at your brothers and sisters and ask me to have you feel the same things and to see the same things. Your next step might be as simple as that. We shouldn't miss this because we can't live without it. Because we get filled with the Spirit when we do it. Do you guys see the power of music? That's why it's so important to make music and to sing. Okay, that was the first one, power of music. Let's go to the second one, the grace of music. So the power of music is, I think it can be described as this is what music does to us, point made. Second one, the grace of music is about what music can do. Okay, so look at my highlights. Be filled with the Spirit, shop, the three ings, speaking, singing, and making music. And then you'll see there are added highlights, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Okay. Why the variety? Because Paul wants to cover all types and kinds of music. Do you see it? So it doesn't matter who you are or what kind of music you can make, go for it. It includes all music. And if you are filled with the Spirit, you'll do one of these three things when it comes to music. Now, here's the grace of music. Music can help us to understand and also to experience God's forgiveness. That's really important because we all know it on a head level. But when you experience it on a heart level, it becomes real. Is it a once-off experience? Is it? Absolutely not. It's a continuous experience. Whenever I have conflict with anyone, when there's the moment of reconciliation, you hug it out. So think about our kids. I'm sorry, Dad. Will you forgive me? Absolutely, I will. Let's hug it out. There's a hug every time. There's experience of forgiveness every time. It's not just words and cognitive understanding. So music can help us to understand that and to experience it. And as we sing, and as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we become joyful, right? We become courageous, Right? We commit to this life that Jesus has called us to. We grasp the depth of Jesus' sacrifice for us and our value in Him the more we sing it. Let me say it plain. Here's how music works. Listen to what He did. We are singing about what He did. And then that moment of, He did this for me, 
And then the second moment. For me. Yes, man. Now you're talking. And that's where the grace of music meets you. Because it preaches to you. As you sing about God's love for you, God's forgiveness for you, the new life that comes through the Holy Spirit inside of you, you realize that that's for you. And that's really important for all of us to know. That God showed His love to us in His Son that died on a cross. And not only did His death on the cross defeat sin, death, and Satan, God rose Him or resurrected Him from the dead. Which means there's a whole new way to live from now all the way into eternity. Jesus went first and will follow His pattern. God so loved the world so that we would not perish. Do you guys see the verse, John 3, 16? When we sing that, we preach it to ourselves and we hear it again. And it solidifies that understanding and experience. Anyone, anyone can become a child of God through Jesus Christ. And we proclaim that through song every single Sunday. Okay, so singing songs about Jesus expresses the spirit within us and it helps the gospel message to sink deeper into our hearts. Okay, let me, let me say it plain. Music evangelizes. Are you with me? And I'm not talking only about gospel music. Secular music also evangelizes. Music persuades, fam. It does. It's so powerful. Music argues. Music works on the deepest possible level. Think about pop music, right? You've got love songs, and then you've got take back my life songs. Do you guys see what I did there? Okay, only the pop people in the house got me on that one. Here's the thing, if you listen to a love song, you go, oh, her love is so awesome, because it's so persuasive. And then you listen to a Take Back My Life song, and you go, love sucks, I never want anything of it. I am me, and I'll do me, and I'm taking back my life. And then you go, what? How did I just go from love is awesome to love sucks? It's because music has the power to communicate in that way. Music evangelizes. So when we sing, and when we mean it, it can actually change people's minds. Does anyone know who Bono is? Lead singer of U2. Look at what Bono said. Words and music did for me what solid, even rigorous religious argument could never do. They introduced me to God. Not belief in God, more an experiential sense of God. That's the power of music. So Bono says, in short, I met God through worship. We say, in short, a disciple knows God through worship. It's true, and Bono said it. So I mean, <laughs> just makes the point now, doesn't it? No, I'm joking. Well, joking, not joking. Real talk, my sermon, Ole Sechel's sermon, Shiami's sermon, Peter's sermon, Murandini's sermon, or anyone else who ever preaches at this church, cannot do to you what music can do to you. Look fam, I'm giving my best here, and I love preaching, and I love prepping sermons, but I know when I stand here, there's something that I cannot do to you. Only music can do that, because music is far more powerful than this proclaimed spoken word. That's why our services consist of worship and word. And that's why we're going to want to give time for worship and word. You would have seen that we snuck some fellowship in the middle, but it's because we want people to talk to each other, and two-thirds of you were late this morning. Do you know what I mean? So we had to create a space for that. Worship is powerful. Okay. I mean, right now... Compelling case, dude. Land it now. How do I do this? I mean, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Then the three ings follow. Like how? Look at Colossians 3, verse 16 to 17. One highlight. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. Yeku, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Yeshua, 
through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Hang on, Paul. In Ephesians, you said, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. And then you gave the list. Now in Colossians, you give us the list again, but you preface it with, let the Word of God, oh, let the Word of Christ dwell richly among you. So which one is it? Is it, let the Word of Christ dwell richly among you? Or is it, be filled with the Spirit? Yes. It's both. Because you encounter God through His Word. Come on now. Look at our triangle. Rudolf, can we have the triangle up quickly, please? Look at our triangle. A disciple knows God through His Word. Through worship. Once again, it's not either or, it's both and. So letting the Word of Christ dwell in you brings forth music, praise, and worship. Think about it, fam. When we read God's Word, it stirs the praise juices. It stirs the singing juices. Because what you see in His Word asks for praise. Do you guys see that? He is worthy of all praise. Okay. Let me show you a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation, like it was meant to be done. And then he says, it is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it's expressed. Oh, C.S. Lewis. What a champ. He says you feel stuff. And when you feel stuff, you express stuff. And when you express stuff, that's when the feeling is complete. Do you see it? So I can look at Marie and I can admire her, but when I say it, the feeling gets completed in me saying it. Do you guys see it? <laughs> Lots of S's there. So when we read God's Word, it stirs up these praises. And then as the Word of Christ dwells richly in us, and as we are filled with the Spirit, the words of praise come, and then C.S. Lewis says, you have to express it. Otherwise, the experience is incomplete. Okay, let me blow your brain. The Greek word used for worship is the word proskineo. Two words. It's a conjunction. The first one is to, so pointed at something. And the second one is kiss. To kiss. That's what worship is. In South African vernacular, it's to blow kisses. To. That's what worship is. Music, fam, brings you to this place. That's the grace of music. The grace of music is that singing can get you there. Look. Proskineo means this. Bowing down and bowing down, and bowing down, and prostrating yourself lower and lower, and kissing, kissing in adoration, worshipping what is in front of you. Have you ever watched a movie where there's a king on the throne? Massive throne, massive corridors, long way to walk to the king. Huge door. Small human going. Oh. And as you enter the throne room, you see the splendor. You feel the weight. You feel the glory. You behold the stature of the king. 
You see all the gold and silver and ornaments against the wall. You realize how privileged you are as you approach the king. And as you approach the king, you become lower and lower and lower and lower until eventually you are in front of the king and you prostrate yourself and you blow him kisses and you worship him because you can see how big he is. That's singing. That's the grace of music, fam. Singing gets us to that place. My word, what a gift. Because that's the place where we have to get to. I mean, I did a really lame prostration now. Like proper job prostration is trying to see if you can get yourself flatter than a leopard on the ground. I don't know, I stretch there now. You guys know what I mean? That's the grace of music. Is that what you come with? Is that how you start your worship set? Because if we are true to the Bible, then that's the way it should work. When we start singing, you should go, throw the room open. Let me, let me enter. Let me see. Let me hear. Let me experience. Let me behold. Are you guys with me? Man, if I was a musician, I would have gotten on the acoustic now and go, yep, let's go, let's go, let's stand up and praise God. But we will do that. We will do that in just a minute. Last point, the future of music. So we spoke about what music does to us. We spoke about what music can do to us. Let's speak about what music will do. I'm going to give you the one-line answer so that you can follow me. Music will be the way in which our unity is best expressed. Okay, that's what music will do in the future. Music will be the way in which our unity is best expressed. Do you know that music was present when everything started in the beginning? Look at God. He's chatting to Job, Job 38, probing Job and going, Hey, dude, listen, can we just talk about when everything was created? Yeah, cool? Okay, let's talk about it. Then God asks him the question, what supports its foundation? This is the earth. Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Have you guys ever seen that verse? Like, we, our Bible starts at in the beginning God created. Before the beginning, in the beginning through which God created, don't know if that landed, there was singing. And there was music. And there were bodies and, and beings that were already praising God. So music has been part of our lives since the beginning of time. And it continues to be a way which we can express our faith in a broken world. Right? So we've already covered that. How expressing our faith while we are going through stuff works. So music has been around. And music is here to stay, right till the end. Look at Psalm 96. This is the psalm writer in a really tough space, looking into the future, writing down what to expect. Look at him. Let the fields and everything in them celebrate. Then all the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the Lord. For He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with His faithfulness. Right at the end, what will there be? There will be singing and there will be music and there will be shouts of joy and celebration. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Who will we sing with? Who will we sing with right at the end? Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. For the one who sanctifies, that's Jesus. And those who are sanctified, that's us. All have one Father. Great news. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Sure. Saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Fam, when we sing, Jesus is singing with us. Do you guys see it? Do you know when we sing? 
our voices become one? Have you ever felt that experience? Look, for, I, I can't sing. I can go harder and softer. Or louder and softer. Like, I've got a volume control. One note, get it in there, and then I just go, ah, or, oh, oh, but that's what I have. So I can't really sing, I can groan. But then if someone stands behind me, and they can sing, Oh my word, what an uplifting experience. Because I piggyback on their singing. Do you know what I mean? It's like this person that can actually sing and my voice is becoming one. So I'm sounding better to myself too. Don't cough, don't flake out now. Get up there because I'm enjoying singing with you. Do you see our voices merge? The writer of Hebrews says that when we worship, our voices merge with the one. And that one is Jesus. And Jesus proclaimed that he will proclaim God's name to his brothers and sisters and that he will sing hymns to him in the congregation. Who of you are curious about where that quote comes from? Can you guys see? In italics, the writer of Hebrews is quoting something. Do you know where that quote comes from? It comes from Psalm 22. Do you know what other quote comes from Psalm 22? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus hangs on the cross and he starts reciting Psalm 22 that starts with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am so alone in this place. And then Jesus finishes the psalm. This isn't the last verse, but he finishes the psalm saying, I am doing this now so that I can be with them, so that we can become brothers and sisters, so that we can sing together. Do you guys see it? The only way we have access to this thing we're doing here is through that moment where Jesus felt forsaken to the deepest possible degree. Look at what He did for us. And because He did that for us, we stand and sing together with Him, proclaiming God's praises and singing hymns to Him. Isn't it just beautiful? The transforming power of music, grounded in the gospel, helps us to rise above our everyday lives. It helps us to experience a deeper connection with Jesus. And that connection changes us and brings joy to us. Before I wrap up, let me call Lesego and Mpo and uh, Tsepo. We're going to sing together. No surprise there. And just so you know, we missed out on Waymaker earlier. So we're going to sing that now. Because why not? And we're also going to sing New Wine. So we're going to sing two songs together now. And those songs are meant to, one, confess what we believe about God and to give space for that confession to come back to us and then for us to respond to it. And then the second one is a response song, a way in which we say through music, well, God, now that I've seen, now that I've felt, create new wine in me. Are you with me? Okay. What makes music and singing so important? The power of music. Fam, maybe this morning your prayer is, God, move me. Move me. Because I know that music can move me. Move me. Maybe you haven't felt that in quite some time. Pray it. Pray it now. The grace of music. Maybe your worship has been lips and no heart and head. And maybe this morning is the moment in which you should say, speak into my soul, Father God. Preach to me. My soul feels downcast. Let it arise. We spoke about the future of music. Maybe your prayer this morning is, make me one with you, Lord Jesus, and make me one with your family. Like I really want to feel a oneness when we sing together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. We are here because you started with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And somewhere towards the end, you said that you'll be with us as your family, as your brothers and sisters. We thank you for your sacrifice and for your gift of salvation. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you together through song and music. Father God, when we sing now, I want to pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters. If some of us need to be moved this morning, then move us. If our souls need to rise and be spoken into, please do so through your music. If we feel alone and isolated, creating us this feeling of unity, this singing together that will continue right the way through the end and the beginning all the way.